Light looked down and saw darkness and night. I will go there, said Light. Hope looked down and saw fear and despair. I will go there, said Hope. Peace looked down and saw violence and war. I will go there, said Peace. Joy looked down and saw sadness and sorrow. I will go there, said the joy. Love looked down and saw indifference and hatred. I will go there, said love. So he, the Lord of light and hope, the Prince of peace and joy, the King of love and life, came down and crept into our world, a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. He became, he became like us, so that we might become like him, beloved children of God.
this Christmas Eve, in anticipation of the birth of Christ, let us unite our hearts and our minds and our spirits in prayer. We thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, for the gift of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for your grace that saves and redeems us. We thank you for your mercy that frees us from guilt and shame. We thank you for your compassion that sustains and heals us. We thank you for your love that embraces and surrounds us. We thank you on this holy night for the joyful songs echoing through our hearts and for the gifts of love given and received. Help us to give ourselves away in joy and love. Set our minds on your kingdom. Inspire us to live trusting you with our very lives. Fill us with hope that remains unconquered in the face of all of life's challenges and trials. Remind us to fear not, for you are Emmanuel. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. We hear now these words from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 2, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our Savior comes tonight. The one we have waited for, who defies our expectations. He comes as a child, powerless. He will establish God's kingdom with mercy and justice, compassion and humility. Our Savior comes tonight. He arrives as an infant, received by Mary and Joseph, wrapped in swaddling clothes, tucked in a manger filled with straw, Welcomed only by beasts of burden, born in a stable, for there was no room in the inn. Our Savior comes tonight. How, How can this little one be, King of kings and Lord of lords? He is so small and vulnerable. Our
our Savior comes tonight. Clothed in human flesh, turning our world upside down, challenging our thoughts and ways, revealing God's new way. Our Savior comes tonight. To save us from our sins, to free the captives, to preach good news to the poor, to comfort all who mourn, to empower us to become children of God. Our Savior comes tonight. And we are here waiting, waiting for light to disrupt the night, waiting for hope to shatter despair, waiting for peace to reign in every heart, waiting for joy to inspire a new song, waiting for love to embrace us. O come, O come, Emmanuel. We now continue reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 2, verses 8 through 14. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God and the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Shining. 
We hear now these words from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 2, verses 15 through 20. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary, and Joseph, and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It appears it doesn't matter what the Bible actually says, for we have our own versions of Bible stories etched on our minds and our souls that have become our telling of the story. The story of the birth of Christ is a primary example. The image we most likely have is depicted in almost every nativity scene we approach during this holy season. There's a state. Mary and Joseph hover over an infant lying in a manger. A donkey and a cow keep watch. Shepherds, surrounded by their sheep, look on. Magi, with a camel or two, hold forth their precious gifts. Despite what the Bible may say, this is the version of Christmas, of the Christmas story we have created for ourselves. But we don't only have visual images of the Christmas story. We have also been given thoughts and feelings to accompany the story. At some point when I was a child, someone told me the story of the birth of Christ in such a way that I received the impression that everyone was waiting for him to arrive and that every day people were looking for some sign of his coming. So as a child, I imagined every young woman aspired to be the mother of our Lord. Shepherds were just waiting for angels to appear. Magi studied the stars every night for some clue that a new king was on his way. I imagine that every child of Abraham had a very deep longing for God, and they were waiting expectantly for the long-promised and the long-awaited Messiah. The Bible, however, tells a different story. Mary is surprised and perplexed by Gabriel's appearance. How could she be the mother of the Messiah? Joseph considered a quiet divorce to graciously spare Mary a public shaming. There was not a single innkeeper in all of Bethlehem who looked at Mary great with child and thought, she, she could be the one. Shepherds were terrified by the heavenly host, and the Magi arrived approximately two years after the birth of Jesus and went to the wrong city. The scribes were not looking for the Messiah. Herod had to rouse them out of bed and demand that they tell him where the Messiah was to be born. When I became old enough to read and study the scriptures for myself, I soon realized that my childhood images were not even close to the biblical descriptions of that time other than old Ananias and Anna. No one, no one in the Bible seems to be longing for the promised Messiah. And certainly no one expected him to arrive as an infant. The Bible tells us that at the right time, God sent his son. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, 
the old gods of the Romans and the Greeks and the Persians were crumbling and no longer garnered the worship and adoration, the devotion and allegiance they had once demanded from the people. These old gods could no longer hold the world together and give meaning to the lives of the people. And so, Augustus Caesar was declared Son of God, Prince of Peace, High Priest. And when he died, he was elevated to the status of God. Augustus Caesar assumed these titles, for he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar, who had ridden into the heavens as a god on a comet. He had established the Roman pox, or peace, with his legions. And he was the chief priest of all the gods of all his empire and his peoples. And yet, from the pages of the Bible, we hear voices from our sacred scriptures declaring that that infant born in a stable is the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the very Son of God. Yet on that night in Bethlehem when he was born, no one was waiting for him, and no one had prepared a place for him. Yet when he emerges at age 30, we soon discover that there was a longing, there was a hunger for a word from God, for a new kingdom defined by God's character and for a glimpse of what life would be like when mercy and grace, compassion and love were the foundational order of all that was. Men and women sought him out and listened intently to him. That moment in time had arrived for God to speak again. Not thundering from a mountain, not writing on tablets of stone, but as a human being, full of grace and truth, who had come to be with his people. It appears to be, or at least I am sensing, that in this peculiar and precarious time in which we are living, there is a longing, there is a hunger, there is a desire for God. We are experiencing in many different ways what life becomes when we push God out of our world and out of our lives and we discover that we are left unto ourselves. In time, all of the Roman Caesars could declare themselves to be God demand that they be worshipped as God, but they could not hold their world together. They too crumbled. Perhaps we too are experiencing an unsettling anxiousness about life when God has been removed from our life Perhaps we are discovering that being spiritual but not religious has its failings. Just as the Christian faith has its failings when the heart and spirit of Jesus no longer define the church. Perhaps we are discovering that if there is no God, there is no grounds for respecting one another. For there is no image of God that we share. There is no way to love self, neighbor, and even enemy if there is no God who is love, for we cannot escape ourselves. Perhaps we are discovering that left to ourselves and our own knowledge and wisdom, with no clear sense of the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, we make a mess of things and there are no saviors among us. Perhaps we are discovering in this peculiar and precarious time that all those years of just coming to church 
just showing up, filling our pew, we did not nurture within ourselves a faith, a trust in God, vibrant and deep enough to encourage us and to sustain us and to grant us hope and inner peace for times like the ones we are facing now. If you are not longing for God, it is hard to see God. The scribes dug through their sacred texts to point the Magi to Bethlehem. But then they went back home and went to bed. They did not become a part of a grand processional on to David's city. No, only the three Magi left Jerusalem that day. The Pharisees, obsessed with keeping the law, could not see the word made flesh, nor hear the truth of his words. The priest could not hear him say that God desired compassion and obedience and not sacrifices. The Sadducees and the high priest, infatuated with the power, with power and the temple, could not see the Lamb who took away the sins of it seems only those longing for God could see this Jesus of Nazareth was a teacher, a prophet, a Messiah, the very Son of God. Which brings us back to this night and our remembrance of the birth of Jesus. Sometimes I think we find it absolutely shocking to acknowledge that we do have a longing, a hunger, a need for God. I think the Christmas story also has a shocking event, effect, for it reveals that God has a hungering, a longing, a need for us. And there's nothing God will not do to meet us here where we are, he will become like us, entering the world he made as an infant. I think because God does not want to frighten us, he chose to send his son into the world as an infant. No one is frightened of a newborn child. They are powerless. Their presence calls forth from us acceptance and love. But I also think that God wants us to understand that Jesus is a gift. God does not assault us. God does not attempt to coerce us. God is not tempted to manipulate us. God does not attempt to overcome us with power. God knows there lies within us, sometimes deep within us, that longing, that hunger, that need for him. We never quite escape it. We never successfully silence it. And there is Jesus, the gift of God's only son. God holds him out toward us and waits to see if we will accept his gift of divine love so that we may experience for ourselves the way of Jesus that leads to life, the truth in Jesus that sets us free, the life Jesus invites us to truly live in freedom, in joy, in hope, in peace, and in faith, discovering that God's last word to us is always a word expressing his love for all humanity. If we accept this gift of Jesus, let us be aware that our response is not simply to believe that he is the very son of God, but to become not only his hands and feet, but also his heart 
and his spirit in our world. The gift of Christ we receive is a gift to be shared. On this Christmas Eve, remember that on that night long ago in Bethlehem of Judea, Jesus, God's gift, came to be like us so that we might become like him. This is the miracle and mystery of Christmas. God is with us in Jesus. Amen. Let us go with these words of blessing. Loving God, we have recalled the birth of Jesus the Christ. May we share this day the song of the angels and the joy of the shepherds with each person we meet along our way. Loving God, close the doors of hostility and hate. Open the windows of love and light all over the world among all your children. May kindness be the gift we offer to everyone. May a blessing of hope be our greeting. May fear be banished from all the earth, and peace make its home in every heart. May Christmas morning fill us with joy, for we are your beloved children, and you are our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, who offers us the ultimate gift of love, the gift of your Son from your own.
Thank you.